Well, hello and welcome again to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. This is episode number 53. We have a question from Magnus. That's a good name. In the interview with Tim Anderson, I heard you say something like, after the age of 35, focus on bodybuilding and mobility. I'm 35 as of April. What program do you recommend for bodybuilding? I guess, and like original strength resets for mobility. Well, I mean, when I, to me, when I say bodybuilding, that's, those are, those are those movements, push, pull, hand, squat, load, carry, however you break them up, um, that are in the 15 to 30-ish rep range. So those five sets of five, three sets of eight. Um, honestly, Magnus, that's why we have the workout generator on the danjohnuniversity.com site. It is basically a program for uh, people 35 and above, actually, or, or anybody who just wants um, to do the basics of mobility, flexibility, um, strength, hypertrophy, bodybuilding, and, and all the rest every day in a simple format. If you can work it in, I'd love to see you do three to five days a week of just the basic workout. Uh, get as much variation in the exercise as you can. So play around like in the squat section with the different squat exercises and uh, just keep kind of uh, bouncing ahead on all those uh, ideas. Um, I do original strength every single day, uh, no matter what we're doing. Uh, the rocks, the nods, uh, the, the, the egg rolls. Egg rolls are phenomenal. Um, so yeah, I would put them in as soon as you can. And uh, it doesn't mean you can't have great goals, uh, Magnus. It just means that most of the time, you know, have some level of uh, repeatability and reasonableness in your training. I hope that helped. We have a question from Steve. Would you recommend Mass Made Simple for a 60-year-old plus lifter? Boy, from my observations in Las Vegas and Disneyland, most people my age don't need more mass. They've, they've seemed to have uh, done a good job with mass. You know, you're going to have to figure out that cost to benefit you for yourself here, uh, Steve, because, you know, I'm asking you to, it's only six weeks, which is, I think, doable. But you're going to have to ask yourself, do I really need six weeks of high rep squats, six weeks of complexes? Uh, I know what the follow-up question is going to be, uh, you know, what modifications would I do? And I don't believe in modifying two-week, four-week, six-week programs. Um, so the answer would be a, a hesitant no, because, you know, in any, any mass you put on past 60 might become a longevity issue. Now, you got to be careful how I say that. So we know that grip strength and lean body mass numbers are a better indicator for what age is than the number on your, your driver's license. So yeah, you, you might increase your lean body mass in those six weeks, but there is that issue of, you know, you're also going to get some, put some fat on them because that, I mean, actually you eat everything in sight. And of course the follow-up is always, well, can I do lean made simple and just, you know, do mass made simple without all the extra food? Well, and now we're down this road where, the, where you're not doing any, but any program, you're just inventing something. Um, so my answer is um, a sort of no, but if it's something you want to do, uh, I'll support you 100%. Um, I'd love to see the before and after pictures. I'd love to see the, 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 the numbers, uh, how those go. So yeah, I, su I sort of support you if you want to do it, but at the same time, I'll have to also be like the big kid and say, you know, make sure you think it through. Thank you, Steve. Kurt asks, I must be, do you use Olympic rings in your training? Uh, I used to, in the backyard, used to do them a lot. Uh, I like the dislocates. I like the, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of like when you stand upside down on rings when you hold your hand and, you know, doing various uh, uh, feet moves from there. Um, my only concern was, you know, it was a safety issue. I never, I never fully trusted what we had there. And fortunately, when the one did break, I was using it, and I did uh, I did one of those matrix moves to save myself. Uh, I like them. I, I think they've got great value. Boy, they can, you know, I think it's called a bird's nest. That's where you bring your feet up into your hands backwards. Great flexibility move. Um, they do some interesting things for the shoulders. 
Uh, they're truly fun. I invented a, uh, I can't remember what we used to call it, but a, a ring swing, a ring swing. And basically it's where you, uh, you're doing kind of the opposite of a kettlebell swing, uh, but you're like a little kid in the park where you're pumping. Uh, if you, you pump with your legs to make it swing, and it was a great little exercise, but ours broke. I haven't replaced it. And it's no one, not one person has mentioned it in the, the last few years. So yeah, I like them. I think, I think they're nice. Like everything in the gym, those Kurt, they just, they're just so overdone. So people beat these things to death. So yes, they're valuable. No, they're not the cure for cancer. No, they're not going to get you to Mars. They're fine. Uh, if you have them, use them. If not, you, you make your choice. I, I would not suggest getting them. We have a question from Ernesto. I recently lost my father to cancer, and with the pandemic, I wasn't able to be near him. It has been a difficult time. I, I walk with you, Ernesto. I, you know, uh, I wasn't there for either of my parents' deaths, uh, and it was hard. Uh, have you had to deal with unbearable loss? If so, how did you approach your exercise program? I imagine there'll be one, no one size fits all, but you're as wise as you are strong, thank you. Uh, you are kind as you are knowledgeable, and I respect and look up to you greatly. Um, just recently on in Pocket, they had an article uh, about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And of course, if you see the movie All That Jazz, they make fun of her stages of grief. Uh, when I did that grief therapy, I was a I took courses in grief therapy uh, as with my old job. I took a lot of courses with that job. Uh, and we were taught some very important things about grief. And, and really, you've already hinted on it. The problem with Kuba Ross's stages of grief, like especially with me, you know, number one is denial. Uh, I have never, when last summer my nephew called me up when I was in England and said, Uncle Danny, uh, my dad just died. I didn't say no, I said Oh, it's tragic. Um, but those of us who got, who studied a lot of grief and some of these other things, we, we, there's really two things. And, and the first one is there is no process of grief. But, but you need the second one to understand that. And that grief is like more like a roller coaster. Man, if you're in grief, you can be fine and then something sets you off. We had a woman talk about the fact that one day, a school bus went by and she began to cry hysterically. Well, when she thought about it later on, the back of her mind knew that this would have been her, her child's first grade year and the child would have been on a school bus. Now, she had lost a child, I think, four years, five years before, had been fine and out of nowhere, something made her cry. And I, and, I like, and I like that, well, A, I like the fact that she shared it with us, Ernesto, of course. But the other thing is it just reminded me of those weird things that happen during the walk with grief. And I always use walk with on that. That comes from Luke chapter 24, where they walked for seven miles, which is a long walk. I mean, I, I certainly have walked seven miles in my life, and it's hard to do quickly. Grief is hard to go through quickly. Um, I can't, I can't give you a magic pill or a magic wand. Uh, you're gonna have to walk with it for a while. And there's going to be times where you feel like, uh, you haven't thought of your father in a while. And then I'll, the next moment you'll be, you'll have a moment where you're kind of guilty for not have thought about him for a while. I was at a workshop years ago and they told us that it takes 18 months to get over a divorce and that we, uh, some of us at our table talked about in the break because they said that it, it took less time to get over like the death of a spouse. And uh, I made the joke at the time that uh, dead people don't call you. So when you get a divorce, there's always, there's always issues that just keep rambling. So grief from a divorce can be radically different than uh, the, 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 the grief you're going through. Yeah, is there one size fits all? No, but a couple of things that you're going to have, they're going to have some feelings of loss, Ernesto. Uh, you're going to miss, you know, I don't know what it's like in your family, but in our family, it'd be like Thanksgiving, birthdays, Christmas, 
Super Bowl. Uh, and you're going to have those events that you have to kind of go through. When my mom died, I called because I was in still uh, Utah State. Uh, I called during Thanksgiving and uh, my sister-in-law said, I keep thinking I'm going to walk into her as I go around the corner. And, and I, I remember thinking how that, how that touched me. You know, you're going to reach, something good's going to happen. And that's so you're going to reach for the phone or, and there's no one to call. So, yeah, those, I know these are random thoughts, but Ernesto, they're, they're random thoughts from a guy who's walking with you. Uh, I wish I could, you know, I kind of wish sometime that I did have more insights about grief. But the truth is, most of us will live the bulk of our lives in some kind of grief. Uh, when you graduate from school, there's a grief process. Uh, of it, the, the loss of that schedule, those friends, those professors, those teachers, the, the football team, the whatever. When you move from one house to another, uh, when you move into the new house, one of the first things you'll realize is what advantage you had in the old house. With I don't know. So we're constantly dealing with minor and major grieves in our lives. Um, just know, though, um, you're not alone. Uh, many of us have gone through this before. In fact, I think it was uh, Gandhi who said, um, go find the person in the world who's never grieved, because uh, that person doesn't exist. I'll walk with you, Ernesto. We have a question from Damien. Uh, ominous. Can you elaborate on the bow and arrow and hammer and stone concepts as they apply to real life? I'm having a hard time understanding them. Uh, you had to have kicked a ball at one time in your life or punched somebody or uh, th thrown something at somebody. Uh, the bow and arrow concept is where you huh, you use your body stretch reflexes to, you know, um, to snap an implement or something forward. So when you go to punch somebody, you don't walk up and go poof like that with just your tricep extensions. So you, the way I see personal trainers talk about throwing and training, you'd think that the, you actually fight by doing uh, what is a French press or whatever. Now, if you really want to hurt somebody, you wind it back and you come in and you set up this dynamic tension across your body, stretch, pop, release, and, bad, and, and good things happen. It's snapping your fingers. Um, you build up all that tension, you let it go and it makes a sound. Too much tension, nothing happens. Too little, no sound. It's got to be just right. When you throw the discus correctly, and yeah, I, I tell you, I haven't done it many times, but when you get that one where you feel the chest, you don't throw with your chest, you pop the chest, you stretch reflex the chest. So that's a bow and arrow concept. And uh, if you, that doesn't help you, go buy one of those British uh, throwing books. They do a real nice job with this concept of the stretch reflex and the bow and arrow. St Hammer and Stone is uh, Stu McGill's concepts. Similar, but there are nuanced differences in my mind. Uh, hammer is when you hit the ground and with, with this big hammer, bam! The bigger hammer, the more force you're driving into the ground and that's going to cause a uh, uh, Newton's uh, law, action, phew, reaction. So if it's your left foot and you hit it on the ground really, really hard, that reaction sends you really high. Uh, the stone is your body, and if you hit, <laughs> if you hit your left foot on the ground with all kinds of energy, but it dissipates because you're, you're well, either not knitted together by the way you train, or you have a leakage is the word we use in kettlebells. Um, even though you and I both hit the ground with the same force, my body's ability to stay rock solid allows me to go higher than yours. Your body, the, a stoneless person's body, would wobble that energy off in a bunch of different directions. That's, that's about as good as I can do today. Um, I hope that helps. Thanks, Damien. We got an email here from Ken. I'm a 42-year-old Highland Games athlete who is prepping for my first powerlifting meet. The meet is in October, and, and I am only doing it out of boredom and knowing I can set the state record in the deadlift. Okay. 
My question is regard to your post powerlifting meet, getting ready for my next throwing season. I am a strong first guy, okay, and do mostly kettlebell work, but also USAW certified, so I'm familiar with Olympic lifts. Well, being certified and being familiar with the Olympic lifts, I, I, from what I've seen, doesn't mean the same thing. I mean, I hope, I mean, I hope you at least snatch body weight and clean, you know, 20 to 50 pounds more uh, above that. Um, all this barbell work has made me miss kettlebells, so my question is, what would be good in preparation for next season? I am looking to al alternating between a kettlebell program of four to six weeks and one of your throws programs like Transformation or Big 21. What would your recommendation be for al alternating with barbell work? Well, you're, you're just, it just seems like you're all over the map here. After that power lift you meet, you're gonna be plenty strong enough. Um, I always used three, just three blocks. The first block was the, the, the heavy, the heavy training, which you're doing naturally. Uh, October, you know, you could probably keep training heavy on the barbell. October, November, December. I would, yeah, I would, yeah, because the weather in most of the United States or wherever you're from usually is a little colder. Uh, stay, stay in the weight room after that powerlifting meet. I would suggest getting back to the Olympic lifts for a while. And then once you start bringing in your heavy throwing period, the next phase, keep lifting. But I like where your head's at here, these four to six week kettlebell programs. But the transformation is just a two week thing. The transformation program is just a two week gap thing to make sure you're still touching the bar and, and still being refreshed. Uh, certainly I've done the transformation program longer. I think 12 weeks is my record. Uh, but you know, after about a month, I think I just got bored. And if you're gonna do the big 21, and good luck if you decide to do it, if your outdoor season starts in April, you'd have to have that done by February, maybe the first week of March, so you have plenty of time to recover from it. And that does seem to help get people ready to throw far. Um, we did two things back in the day with my high school throwers. We had them do the three week big 21, and uh, the following Tuesday, we did the, the workout where we did the 1,000 discus turns. Stretch, one, two, three, stretch, one, two, three, a thousand times. Almost universally the next week, if the conditions were good, they would all break massive PRs, uh, including, uh, of course, Paul went from 181 to 214. So, um, Because, you know, we're, I always argue that that time of year, you, I'm, I stretched you, I stretched you, I stretched you. And then I had the ability as a coach to let you go. So the big lifting period, Ken, that's going to put you October. You're going to have that meet. You'll have to recover a little bit from it. I would Olympic lift after that for a while. And then once you get to your heavy throwing phase, I think your kettlebell idea is pretty good. And finish it off with uh, somewhere, somewhere get that big 21 three weeks in. I, wouldn't, I don't know if you need to throw those three weeks. Or just do drills, and then after that, you know, then it's just com competitive throwing. I would keep your hand basically wherever you are strength level wise. Let your strength levels come down, and it's okay. Watch lift left less weights. Watch the numbers come down, and then of course get your competitions in. I think many people way overtrain during the Highland Games season. Of course, the fact is it's 52 weeks a year for some people now, so there is no there's no way to coach that logically except through you know just wait for the surgeries for the rest periods uh, but your question about alternating barbell with kettlebell work or just do both in workouts you know um, you know if you know put sw if you're doing something kind of heavy and slow you know do swings and snatches after it uh, uh, good luck you on that powerlifting meet and I'd like to I wish I would have known your body weight and what that state record is in the deadlift, but we'll talk soon, okay? Let me know how it goes. Okay, bye-bye. Mitchell asks, I've been a trainer for a long time and I've done my best to educate myself and stay up to date on all the best practices in our industry. I feel like I have so many truths in my mind, but nothing to unite them. I feel like I've had so much to offer this world if I could just articulate it. I admire the way you are able to articulate your philosophies and principles, quadrants, and continuums. I have found myself relating to your work more than any other, but I'd like to know 
more about your journey to knitting it all together. When did you realize you could define your beliefs and what advice do you have for someone like me? Well, Mitchell, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the difficult question. I mean, you know, that quadrant, the, the, that quadrant, uh, the easy strength one, um, where quadrant one is basically youth PE, quadrant two, collision sports, collision occupations, quadrant three, you know, most people track and field athletes, then quadrant four, the rare era of maybe the 100 meters, Olympic lifting, powerlifting, basically we only have one one quality at the highest levels. You know, that took me the better part of three years. Uh, what helps me the most, Mitchell, is people ask me a question like this, and then I'll go, you know, I'll say something like, oh, you know, it depends. And I'll start to talk for 45 minutes, because <laughs> it depends. And all of a sudden, as, as this stuff unpacks, I realize that you're asking this question, I'm answering it this question, and we're not saying the same things. We're using the same language, but we're talking about radically different things. So I have to say, okay, I'm talking about a discus thrower versus a shot putter. And you might hear that as the same guy. Like, no, no. Radically different arousal levels to compete. Um, you know, and so what, what I have to do is, as I try to discern things and make clarity, um, I begin to pick up, uh, okay, to answer, because you couldn't understand my answer, that makes me think, and that starts everything. And I think, you know, uh, also too, uh, Mitchell, you know, I've been keeping little notes since 1973. I keep a journal that's loaded with billions of doodles and insights and stuff. Um, that's my current one. Here's my 2000 and 2003, 2004 journal. Uh, the back pages, uh, you can't really say it right. The back pages are loaded with thoughts and insights. Uh, things that work, <laughs> July 3rd. Um, you know, <laughs> eggs, meat, fish was number four on that list. Um, <laughs> unlifting. I, I love and basically hang snatches. I thought hang snatches were the answer to all questions. And it's funny because that was a good year for me. Uh, says talks about sled work so much, you know? so so those would be the that little toolkit I just so, showed you might be helpful for you to think about because the uh, sometimes the knitting well I mean if we're going to use the word knitting uh, we're going to talk about making a tapestry I mean how long does it make take to, to make a tapestry uh, that's a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of thinking so that's how you do it <laughs> a lot of work a lot of effort and a lot of thinking Mitchell. Hey, you know what? That's a pretty good question. Um, Mitchell, I'd like to come back to this sometime. If you want to, I want you to think about it and then get back to me. I, I, I like that. Talk soon, okay? Ryan asked a question. Uh, you mentioned in a recent video the fact that double kettlebell cleans and the double kettlebell front squats are underappreciated full body lifts. I was wondering if you could expand on that. Well, Ryan, the first thing I'd tell you to do is go do them and then report back. Um, we're, when we're doing those those workouts where uh, I do this sometimes at, at the certs, it's a, it doesn't sound like much, but you do uh, five double kettlebell cleans, five double kettlebell squat, front squats, uh, four, four, three, three, two, two, one, one. It's only 15 front squats and 15 cleans. But when the people put the weight down, I mean, their eyes but pop. It's like, what happened? Um, what I like about the double kettlebell clean is that everything's so tight and fast, and it feels like most sports. Uh, as much as I love the barbell clean, um, because it's so, I mean, there's a bit of an art form to it. You gotta clear, the, you gotta clear your knees, you gotta whip your elbows, you gotta catch the weight right, and that's all teachable stuff. And, you know, over time, you're a master. But the double kettlebell clean feels like an American football uh, play. It feels like the way you play American football. Um, so for me, that's why. And Ryan, I want you to go. If you haven't done them, I want you to do them. Uh, if you don't know how, find out. But uh, you'll get a sense. Um, my favorite part of the kettlebell clean and front squat is that the weight is always trying to slide down. So you have to use your anaconda strength to keep those bells in place. And it's, you know, <laughs> double 24s, 
just isn't very much weight, you know, uh, for, for my American audience. It's, you know, you're front squatting 110 pounds. It's nothing. It's nothing. And yet, because they're sliding and because they're in a weird position and you have to stay with total body tension, they're much harder than they look. So I think that's why, uh, Ryan, why we do this. Really interesting question from Nate. Um, I would be interested to hear your you apply Pascal's wager. Um, when in doubt, the simplest is, you know solution: Occam's Occam's razor, Pascal's wager. I think at one time uh, we had a discussion in a classroom where we discussed this for for a long time. But basically, you know, if you know. Always pick the thing with the highest, best cost to benefit ratio. Okay. To the idea debate about wearing masks. To be clear, I've been wearing one and I'm not looking for an excuse not to. Listen, man, I, I can't say how, how. Yeah, I think you should wear a seatbelt, not for your safety, so that I don't have to be at your funeral and go, what kind of idiot doesn't wear a seatbelt? I wear a mask because my friend Sarah. God bless her. She's got some lung issues. And if I can do anything I can to keep her around a couple more birthdays, I'm here for her. And that's that's why I wear a mask. I'm not wearing one now, obviously, because I'm in my home, where I've been basically since March uh, 15th or 16th. And I try to spend a lot of time in my home. Um, fortunately, I have my own home gym, you know, and I have some other advantages some of you may not have, but, you know, sometimes people put the word freedom, free to wear a mask. But, you know, my family is very, very military, lots of teachers, lots of police, lots and lots of first responders in my family. When my nation calls, my family joins. When my community calls, my family joins. When my neighbors call, my family joins. And because I believe in freedom, but I, what you need to have with freedom is duty. So, Nate, wear your mask. Thank you. Henry writes us, Later this year, I want to do a strength building program. I have done easy strength over the lockdown prior to the, e, prior to the easy strength Olympic workouts, and considering that, but have read it up on 531 with Jim Wendler's great program and considering that option. My question is, who do these routines favor? Well, anytime I give you an easy strength uh, program, uh, I'm favoring people who've been training a while, who have kind of, they know what it feels like to, you know, throw up in a bucket. They know what it feels like to have a few uh, uh, niggling injuries, you know. They know what it feels like to... Uh, you know, hit the wall with with load and progression, and th my programs give them permission to uh, go back and retrain the nervous system with lots and lots of successful reps and make them feel good and just keep building, 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 and magically, all of a sudden, one day your your strength numbers are through the roof. Um, with Jim Wendler's 531 program, uh, if I was ever going to recommend uh, the most do this program I've ever seen, it's Jim's program. I, I've i never seen it not work well. Not, not perfectly, no, and, and I'm, I'm sure Jim would accept that. And those of you who've done 531, is it a perfect program? No, because there's no such thing as a perfect program. So I think. Jim's favors just about everybody, except for people who can't squat, deadlift, bench press, or press. They both appear to sell themselves as do this and save your energy for another activity, do this and get out of the weight room in a short period of time. And most importantly, me, set yourself up to a big strength over the long haul. For a 51-year-old athlete who wants to get stronger, that's the one rabbit I'm chasing. And, a co and occasionally do a workout with mates which is more about the socialization, which lends itself best. Well, if you do something like, if you're going to really follow Jim's 531 program and do the conditioning that goes along with it, 
yeah, I like that. But, uh, I mean, if you've really done easy strength Olympic lifting, you know, the maybe 8 to 12 weeks of it, you know, that's going to set you up conditioning-wise to do anything. Those complexes are, they're, they're brutal. That three sets of eight, Dave, complex C, oh, I hate the damn thing, you know? Um, so here's a terrible answer for you, Henry. You can't go wrong. All your options here are really good, and I, and I think confidently that if you do what the programs, what I'm reading here, you'll be just fine, okay, man? And uh, 51's young. 51's young. I threw stuff really far at 51. All right, my friend. Thank you. Okay, we got a question from Greg. Earlier this year, I emailed you for advice on how to train my high school do hurdler daughter, Becky. We followed the advice, and although I have no idea if her hurdling improved, shut down, stopped the hurdle training, her high jump did improve four inches. <laughs> Greg. You're doing it right. Uh, four inches. That's, that's high jumper. Yeah, you, you, you're good. You're good. Um, to Michael Scott, you're good. Uh, with no improvements to her technique, last practice before the shutdown, uh, took a jump on a lark and was very, very pleasantly surprised. I attribute the high jump improvement to the Barry Ross strength training program. Yeah, good. My daughter's my daughter's best friend Lisa is a good high school pole vaulter. Uh, they are now training together in my backyard. I'm looking for some advice to hopefully improve Lisa as a pole vaulter, especially since she cannot actually vault at this time. I got some help here. I, I have also told Lisa to do tumbling to build endurance for the repeat competitive vaults, good, and practice falling, good. I think this would be more pole vault-like than doing long sprints to build endurance and we'd be better to stimulate the usage of the vestibular system in vaulting. Greg, you're okay, yeah. Do you have any recommendations or guidance to improve what we are currently doing to improve Lisa's pole vault performance? Also, any advice on helping Becky and Lisa stay motivated to train? It's been very difficult with spring track canceled, summer track canceled, and possibly that winter track may not happen either. That's a whole separate thing, first off, any ch any chance at all, Greg? You could put up some. Um, any chance at all, you could put up some ropes. Uh, I have a rope in my backyard. Uh, I, I, earlier question, I did have two of those gymnastics rings. I would strongly suggest a rope as best you can. Now the the problem is the rope I have is one of those uh, like navy grade ropes. It's way too thick. But uh, if you could get ropes that would be appropriate to their to their grip. Rope climbing, rope swinging, uh, doing doing like uh, leg raises while swinging, you know, Tarzan swinging, having some fun. You might even want to get two ropes, one with knots in it, so they can you know they can use their feet, and then the other one more for uh, 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 you know for the swinging and stuff. You uh, if you had if you can get some gymnastics rings and do all variations of pull ups and swinging, that might be a good idea too. Um, you know, we don't, I, worst things have happened in life. I mean, the, you know, my college coach uh, and my high school coach talked about the fact that they're, um, they couldn't compete for a few years because of something called World War II. So comparatively, you know, uh, I mean, I don't know how you measure this, but uh, I am, on the motivation thing, one of the things you can tell them is, in a sense, no athletes in a long time have had such an opportunity to do things like they can do the foundational work that they should have we used to always do and that we don't. So I would sell this, and I mean sell this, as an opportunity to um, get better. I mean, just get better. So, um, yeah, it's going to be boring. You're not going to have the fun of track meets, but, you know, the nice thing about track is, you know, we can go to the track and time ourselves and see if we got better. Like your daughter's jump going up four inches. So on the motivation thing, I'm not as strong on that because, I don't know, but, you know, you can still probably go out to the track sometime and just, you know, run a race or just do some time thing or just sell them on this 
great opportunity to have the most general preparation in the history of track. Good luck. Well, we have a question from Anonymous. And from, I had a, I had a great person help me in my past. Um, Terry Fitzgerald, great man. Probably the best leader I've ever worked with in my life. Um, he taught me that true management was managing by wandering around. That's the word I believe it was Tom Peters used. But uh, you know, he was when he was a principal, he'd walk into every classroom every day. He'd go to every practice, uh, wrestling practice, and then walk over the basketball practice, and then go down to the drill team girls, and then walk into the debate. You know, honestly, he probably spent only about. 15 seconds, I mean, or less. And I would look up in the middle of a lecture and I would, you know, and I'd get the little nod and I'd nod back, or if it's something I thought he might be interested in, I'd, I'd, I'd mention. Otherwise, he would just drop his head in. So when a parent would call, he would be able to say, "That's I've been in his classroom a thousand times. He doesn't wear camouflage makeup and shoot at the students every day. The thing he taught me most, though, was where you get your information from. And if he got an anonymous letter, even if it had photographs, it had had proof, it had receipts, he would throw it in the garbage and he would say, everything in there is wrong. Because we, we are not a people, and there was a specific kind of community I was involved in, who believe in anonymous. And anonymous leads you into a lot of ugly areas. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's some... Uh, totalitarian countries on this planet that really like anonymous. Well, I don't. So I don't like to answer emails from anonymous. Um, Brian uh, clears out the, the, the emails for me. And I've told him completely I don't want them. So just a quick reminder, I don't want anonymous. Uh, even, if you have, even if you give me a nickname, or that's fine too. Uh, uh, we have a lot of people give us a lot of good information on these pod, uh, podcasts, personal information. The, the young man talking about the loss of his father. Uh, people just share a lot of important information about their body. And so let's, let's spend time on the people who want to uh, be part of the conversation. Uh, the next question is from Warren. Warren asks, I'd like to know if you have any advice on building athletic endurance. It's a lot more specific than you think. I'd like to participate in the occasional obstacle course race, and I have one coming up in six weeks. It will be eight miles with lots of long hills. I've done several and survived. Survive, that's n thrive, <laughs> survive. Those sometimes are different directions. But I'd like to know if you have any advice to build running all-purpose endurance in sw six weeks or longer, or longer than six weeks for future reference. I'm aware to work on running, running is required, but I'm not sure lots and lots and lots of running is the most efficient way to go. I have no injuries, but I have in the past, when daily require, running was a work requirement. Are the things I can do in the gym to supplement build endurance in addition to a reasonable amount of money? I, I feel like I just answered something like this similar, but still let's do this. If it's a eight mile race, I would recommend the old tradition we have a track, three times your race distance is what you should probably run in a week. So I would say you probably need to run about 24 miles a week. Now that is not a lot. Now obviously, I mean, if it's if you do, you know, three miles a day, well, boring, but for six days, you're going to cover those numbers. But I want to talk about this. What I would consider is that maybe one day a week, you have a garbage run of the eight miles uh, with, with one extra thing. On that run, try to find places where you can jump up and do pull-ups. So you run, you go into a park, you get on the monkey bars, you do a few pull-ups, you run. I want you to practice pulling yourself up uh, tired. And then uh, you could probably work out to a, a two-mile run, a, a five-mile run, just, you know, to kind of vary it to some other ways. But uh, that one day a week, I think that run is going to be really important that you run the eight miles with those, uh, those monkey bar pull-ups or whatever you got. As I said in the last time, um, in my neighborhood here, so we would, I would probably have you go from my house to the schoolyard behind me uh, they have a really nice uh, uh, playground, and then run over to Southwood Park, which is over here. Again, really nice playground, and then run back to here. And here we probably have you do something. Um, 
I mean, it could be simple as a, a complex, or it could be a set of squats, or it could be, I don't know, farmer walks or swings or whatever, and then have you rotate out and go do it again. Yeah, it might take a while. It might take the better part of, you know, hour, an hour or two, but the nice thing is that you keep doing those. Uh, so, in toto, 24 miles a week. One day, the, the run with calisthenics, and if you can't find a park or pull-up bars, you can just keep using your head, you know. Um, and t you can even do what we do in some of our workouts. Um, today, uh, uh, Mike and Charlie did the workout where they did it. Olympic lifting complex, walked out of the gym, uh, heavy hand, 400 meters, Olympic lifting complex, heavy hand. You could fight, use your base and have some equipment ready to go. Uh, go for, a, I would say, at least a half half mile, maybe 800 meters, 1200 meters at least, come back, do the next thing, so that you're accumulating exhaustion, which is something you don't want to do. Uh, on the other runs in the week, uh, just get them in, and then in the weight room itself, I would try to, if you're not rope climbing and monkey bars, I think you're, you know, uh, breaking, I, th I think you're missing the boat here. If you don't have monkey bars, you could probably do uh, the bear hug, bear, uh, bear crawl, bear crawl family. I'd have you do that anyway. Um, I do have the program on the site, the the, uh, the, the climbers pro. I used to call it Adam's climber program. Um, someone gave me 12 weeks to get them in shape to do a, a serious mountain climb, and they did it. And we got it through. There's some ideas there about doing uh, walking seesaw presses. Um, swings, obviously, different stretches, uh, some ideas about going out for walks. Um, I would stay away from anything that, you know, uh, the big three, deadlift, bench, deadlift, uh, and uh, squat. You're going to have to think about that as we get closer and closer, less and less of that. Um, I would suggest some ballistic work, whatever that means to you, playing catch with a medicine ball or kettlebell swings or Olympic lifts, but, uh, yeah, uh, I think you'll be okay, and I think a lot of people don't appreciate the the, the fun and, and value of those obstacle course races, and just doing obstacle courses every day. Thank you, um, and let me know how you do, okay? Thanks so much. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you once again. This was podcast number 53. If you have questions, please email them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. And I'll do my best to answer your questions. Thank you.